most welcome to the ninth lecture of my series on complex analysis. In this lecture, I shall discuss about analytic functions and Cauchy Riemann equations. I hope you have already watched my video on continuity and differentiability of a function of a complex variable. If not, you must watch that before you start watching this one. The link is in the description below and you can see above as well. Before I define analytic functions, let us quickly recollect the definition of differentiability of a function of a complex variable. If G is an open set in the complex plane, if G is an open set in the complex plane C and F is a function from G to the complex plane C, then F is differentiable at a point A in G if limit H approaches to 0 F of A plus H minus F of A divided by H exists. The value of this limit is denoted by F prime A. and is called the derivative of f at a. So, for existence of the derivative, this particular limit has to exist. So, that is the definition of derivative of a function of a complex variable, which I discussed in my previous lecture. If a function f is differentiable at each point of g, we say that f is differentiable on g. Now, notice that if f is differentiable on g, f prime a also defines a function from g to the complex plane. If f prime is again continuous, then we say that f is continuously differentiable. Means the derivative is also continuous. The derivative is continuous. Continuous. Now, this is very important. We will use this terminology a lot in the coming few minutes. Continuously differentiable means f prime, that is the derivative, is also continuous. Now, if f prime is again differentiable, we say that f is twice differentiable. We say that f is twice differentiable. So, twice differentiable means f prime is again differentiable. And we say that f is infinitely differentiable if or each successive derivative of f is again differentiable. If this happens, then we say that uh, my function f is infinitely differentiable. Now, remember this terminology also. We will use this terminology also a lot in the literature. So, continuously differentiable means the derivative is continuous and infinitely differentiable means each successive derivative is again differentiable. Now, let us define analytic functions. Let us see what we mean by analytic functions. Uh, a function, a function f from g to c, g is an open set in the complex plane c, is analytic if f is continuously differentiable, if the function is continuously differentiable, if this happen, happens, then we say that the function is analytic. So, this is the definition of analytic function. So, this is our definition of analytic function. So, that means a function is analytic if it is 
continuously differentiable in the open set G. In the open set G. Now it can be shown that a differentiable function is analytic. Any differentiable function is analytic. We can show it. Hence, the above definition can alternatively be stated as if the derivative f dash z, if the derivative f dash z exists, exists at all z in your open set G, then we will say that the function is analytic in G. So alternatively, it can it can be stated as a function is said to be analytic in an open set G if f dash z that is the derivative exists at all point in G. An analytic function is also defined as we say that a function is analytic. We say that a function is analytic. A function f is analytic at z zero if f is differentiable. If f is differentiable at z zero and a neighborhood and a delta neighborhood of z zero. I have discussed the concept of delta neighborhood in my previous videos. So you can uh, uh, see, you can watch those videos for a clarification about delta neighborhood. So all these definitions are, are kind of equivalent. Uh, now, uh, it is worth mentioning here that we can prove every analytic function is infinitely differentiable. And furthermore, has a power series expansion about each point of its domain. Now, such results make the theory of analytic functions more generalized and vast compared to the theory of differentiable functions of, of, a, of a real variable. Now, clearly, in order for fz to be analytic in a region R, fz has to be differentiable in that region. That means this limit must exist in that region. Now, uh, we know that existence of this limit implies that this h, whenever this h tends to 0, through any approach path possible, this expression will approach to the same value. That is the meaning of existence of this limit, we are, which I have discussed so many times in my video of limit of a function of a complex variable or double limit of a function of two variable. That whenever we, we, we talk about existence of limit like this, then this h can approach to zero via any path. And for each of those and for any of those infinite approach paths, this expression what on, on whatever expression this limit is applied should approach to the same value. So this is what has to happen if the function has to be analytic. That is the primary requirement. So let us consider, let us consider that uh, fz is analytic and let us do some derivations to see what follows from that uh, hypothesis. So my supposition is let fz is analytic. This is my supposition. Let fz is analytic. Therefore, what will happen? Therefore, limit h approaches to 0 f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h exists. That means, uh, this h can approach to 0 via any path or through any path. And whenever h approaches to 0 in any path, this expression fz plus h minus fz by h should approach to the same value. Okay, let us see. Let us, let us evaluate the limit in two different ways. That is, we consider two possible approach paths of h tends to 0. Case one, uh, let, let h approaches to zero through real axis, 
through the real axis. Let us see what happens in that case. Further, let f z is equals to uh, say z is x plus i y. Say z equals to x plus i y. Uh, that is, uh, we can write as u x y plus i v x y. Let us consider that f z is uh, is this. We know that uh, every function of a complex variable can be uh, expressed in this particular form for some u and some v. Now, for h to be real and h not equals to 0, h approaches to 0 means we know h is not equals to 0 and, and h approaches to 0 through real z axis. That means my h is real. So, we get uh, f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h if I uh, use the notation of u and v, we can write this as, okay, let us first write z as x plus i y, it will be easier for us to understand. So, if I write z as x plus i y and separate the real and imaginary part, then you can write this as x plus h plus i y minus f of x plus i y divided by h. Now, see, f of x plus i y is u x y plus i v x y. So, this will be equal to u x plus h comma y plus i v x plus h comma y minus f of x plus i y that is u x y plus i v x y divided by h divided by h so if we separate the real and imaginary part this will be u x plus h y minus u x y divided by h actually uh, this expression is the whole thing is divided by h uh, plus i into v x plus h comma y minus v x y divided by h. Now, mm, if h, if we let h tend to 0, therefore, we can write, therefore, limit h approaches to 0, 10 to 0, f of z plus h minus f z divided by h. This will be equal to limit h approaches to 0, u x plus h comma y minus u x y divided by h plus i into limit h approaches to 0 v x plus h comma y minus v x y divided by h. So, this. Uh, fine. Now, can you tell me what will be the limit in the left hand side. Our supposition is if z is analytic, if z is analytic means this limit exists. Now, this limit is the derivative of f z. So, at the point z, that means we can write this as, we can write this expression as f prime z. Now, can you tell me what this particular limit represents? See, u is a function of two variables x, y and this limit says that the increment is taking place only in x. So, can you guess what is this? Absolutely correct. This is the partial derivative of f with of u with respect to x because we know that the definition of partial derivative 
uh, uh, of u with respect to x can be written as del u del x is equal to limit h tends to 0 u x plus h y minus u x y divided by h. So, this will be my uh, definition of partial derivative of u with respect to x we have studied in, 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 in functions of two variables. So, this actually equals to that means the right hand side will now become I can write del u which is a function of two variables x y del x plus i into del v which is again a function of x y del x because this is a similar expression like uh, at the case of u. So, we got that we got that f prime z if f z is analytic and when h approaches to 0 through the real z axis then f prime z is equal to this. Uh, let us consider this as my equation number 1. So, case 1 when h approaches to 0 through real z axis then we have seen that f prime z can be written in this way del u del x plus i del v del x. Fine. Uh, let us consider another another case, the second case that I, 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 I told you at the beginning that we will consider two approach paths. So, now let, uh, let h approaches to 0 through uh, uh, the imaginary z axis, through the imaginary z axis. That means, let me have some space, that means uh, my limit my limit uh, uh, that means my my expression my ratio f of z plus now i h minus f z divided by i h can be written as equal to if i do a simplification in the same way if i do a simplification in exactly the same way uh, what i will be getting here i'll be getting here uh, this will be u uh, now, uh, my uh, real part will be x and my imaginary part will be y plus h because x plus i y plus i h z is z is actually x plus i y. So, if you consider this sum, this will be x plus i y plus i h that means x plus i into y plus h plus v x y plus h iv u plus iv so uh, this is my f of z plus ih minus uh, u xy plus i v xy divided by divided by ih so this will be my ratio uh, now, if we simplify this, we will get an expression, we will get an expression like u x y plus h minus u x y divided by, okay, divided by i h. If I multiply the numerator and denominator by i, I will get here uh, minus i into this divided by h so something like this okay if i write in a proper form this will look like this will be something like u x comma y plus h minus this so minus i into this multiply the numerator and denominator by i and the second term will be plus uh, if I take if I if I take this i common I will cancel in the numerator and denominator so it will be v x comma y plus h minus v x y divided by h this now now letting h h tends to zero as the previous case now letting h tends to 0 as the previous case we get. Now, letting 
h approaches to 0 as the previous case, we get the left hand side as f prime z and the right hand side as uh, this will be minus i into. Now, what will be uh, what will be this expression? Limit h tends to 0 u x y plus h minus u x y divided by h as h tends to 0. Can you tell me what will be this expression? Absolutely correct. Now, we can see that the increment is happening in y and x is remaining constant. So, uh, this will be minus i del u x y del y plus uh, similar here, a similar case here, this will be del v x y del y. So, this will be my uh, case when uh, uh, when h approaches to 0, when h approaches to 0 through the imaginary z axis. Now, I am marking this as equation number 2. Uh, now, can you tell me what I get from equation number 1 and equation number 2? So, this is my equation number 1. If prime z is equals to del u del x, plus i del v del x. So, if I write again, if I write again equation number 1, 1 again, so it will be easy for us to compare. If prime z we got as del u x y del x plus uh, i into del v x y uh, del x. This had been my equation number 1. This was my equation number one. This was my equation number one. So uh, essentially, you can see since the uh, uh, the function is analytic, this will have a unique value. F prime z will have a unique value. What that implies, if we compare the real and imaginary parts, what do we get? We get that. If we compare the real and imaginary parts, we get we get del u is a function of x y del x. Uh, the real part here will be equal to this. So, del u del x will be equal to del v. v is a function of x y del y. And uh, if we compare the imaginary parts, we get del u this one with a negative sign consider this negative sign also and compare this is your imaginary part for the second so if we consider the negative sign we will get del u del y will be equal to minus del v which is a function of two variables del x so we got that whenever our function f is analytic Whenever our function f is analytic, what has to happen? These thing has to happen. These two equations has to hold if my function is analytic. Del u del x is equal to del v del y. Del u del y is equal to minus del v del x. Now, these equations are known as, these two equations are known as the famous Cauchy, Riemann, Cauchy Riemann equations. Hugely uh, useful. We will use this equations lots of times uh, in, in, in the coming uh, portion of our course. And these are extremely useful. And this will make uh, 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 finding derivatives and testing whether a function is analytic or not lot e is easier. But as of now, we got that. If my function is analytic, then these equations will be satisfied. Then this cauchy riemann equations or, or popularly known as or people call them as CR equations. If my function is analytic, then this cauchy riemann equations will be satisfied. So analytic, if my function is analytic, that implies your Cauchy-Riemann equations will be satisfied. 
Hence, these Cauchy Riemann equations are necessary conditions only, not sufficient. So that means up to this, whatever we have seen, that these Cauchy Riemann equations are necessary only. are necessary only, not sufficient. Because this tells you when the function is analytic, then these conditions will be satisfied. So it is a necessary condition for an analytic function. The sufficient condition for Fz to be analytic is in addition to satisfying CR equations or cauchy Raman equations, the four partial derivatives del u del x, del u del y, del v del x, del v del y need to be continuous also. So, the sufficient condition is, so the sufficient condition is, sufficient condition for analyticity is, the sufficient condition for a function to be analytic is, CR equations, cauchy Riemann equations, plus the four partial derivatives that is del u del x, del u del y, del v del x, del v del y has to be continuous, has to be continuous uh, in your region, in, in your region uh, uh, G, whatever, wherever you are, you are testing for analytic, where you are, wherever you are testing for the function to be analytic. So, in addition to your CR equations, the four partial derivatives has to be continuous also. So, this is the sufficient condition for a function to be analytic. That means if we have to test whether a function fz is equal to u plus iv is analytic or not, we will simply test whether this cauchy Riemann equations are satisfied or not, and along with that, whether the four partial derivatives are, are, are continuous or not. To see this, to see this, uh, let us consider, let us consider that uh, G, to see this, let us consider that G uh, be a region in the plane, and let, let U and V, let U and V have continuous partial derivatives have continuous partial derivatives say of first order del u del x del u del y del v del x del v del y partial derivatives in g furthermore uh, suppose that u and v satisfy cr equations also now let me tell you this portion of the derivation will be a bit lengthy and a bit tricky. So be extremely careful. So our, what do you want to see? We want to see that whenever these two conditions are satisfied, the function f becomes analytic. What is my function f? My function f actually fz is equals to uxy plus i into vxy. This is my function f. And we want to visualize whenever these two conditions as stated here, as stated here, let me have a red marking. As stated here, uh, whenever these two are satisfied, then uh, the function is analytic. That is, we want to see. Okay, fine. Uh, let first let me have some space. Let z is equals to x plus i y is in is in the region G. And say, and say, and uh, h is equals to say delta x, a small increment in z, that is uh, delta x plus i delta y, small increment in x and y. Small increment in z means there will be small increment in x as well as small increment in y. So then we can write then uh, u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x comma y. Uh, this can be written as if we do a bit manipulation, 
this can be written as u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x comma y plus delta y i have subtracted this so i have to add it in the uh, with the next term so this will be plus u x comma y plus delta y minus u x y so this the thing remains same i have subtracted here i have added here now uh, if we apply the mean value theorem if we apply the mean value theorem uh, for the derivative of a function of one variable uh, see why i am thinking about applying mean value theorem for a function of one variable if you look carefully uh, this part of your expression if you look carefully for at this part of your expression here your y value remains intact only there is a change in x value and here also if you look at this part of the expression the manipulation has been done in that way here your x value remains intact only y value changes so we can consider the the case of mean value theorem for the derivative of a function of one variable and if we apply into each of these bracketed expressions then for say each age then for each then for each delta x that means if i write for each delta x plus i delta y in uh, g in my region there exist delta x1 numbers delta x1 and delta y1 such that mod of delta x1 will be less than mod of delta x and uh, mod of delta y1 will be less than mod of delta y why why uh, using uh, by mean value theorem by mean value theorem then i can i can write that applying i will get i can draw this kind of a conclusion if i apply mean value theorem applying mean value theorem why i have written this uh, very simple if you if you consider if you consider lagrange's mvt if you consider lagrange's mean value theorem if you consider lagrange's mean value theorem you will get that if a function f is continuous if a function f is if f is continuous at uh, 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 in a b what lagrange's mvt says it says that if f is continuous in a b number 2 if f is differentiable if f is differentiable in a b uh, then what has to happen then then there exist this is important try to understand then there exist at least one value at least one x say uh, that x is c say that x is c such that f b minus f a will be equal to f prime c into b minus a now what is this c this c will be such that a less than c less than b that means c lies in this open interval a b so this is what we know by lagrange's mean value theorem so if we apply lagrange's mean value theorem in this case say for the first bracketed expression i can consider for the first bracketed expression i can consider see actually the change is happening in these in in the x value so i can consider this as my b and this as my a so if i apply the if i if i consider this and apply lagrange's mvt then by the definition what we can write okay let me have that one also in front of you yes so then we can write 
as a result of these two, applying these two, we can write u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x comma y plus delta y is equal to what? If dashed c, that means the derivative, the derivative of the function f at the point c, here it is said. That means here it will be the partial derivative of u with respect to x because the change is happening in x value only. And this c can be written as x plus delta x1. What is delta x1? Delta x1 is such that delta x1 less than uh, mod of delta x1 less than mod of delta x. See here your b was x plus delta x and uh, mod of delta x1 is less than mod of delta x means this point will be less than b and clearly this point will be higher than a also because your a is x. So this x plus delta x1 I can write that this x plus delta x1 if I write this this will be higher than x and this will be lesser than x plus delta x. This is my a, this is my b, this is my c. So Lagrange's expression is totally uh, Lagrange's MVT. Uh, if we apply, we will get this kind of an expression and the other other term will, will uh, means y will, the, the value, the y value, that is y plus delta y, that is remaining fixed here. So, into this b minus a, as per Lagrange's mean value theorem, this is b minus a. So, what is b minus a? b minus a is x plus delta x minus x. So, that is delta x. So, this. So, is it clear? Uh, it's just an application of Lagrange's mean value theorem, nothing else. So, if we apply, we will get this. Now, and if we apply this in the second bracketed expression, you can see here, your x is remaining fixed and your y is changing. This y is changing. So, uh, if we keep that in mind and if we apply a similar kind of uh, 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 interpretation of Lagrange's mean value theorem, we can write this as u, u x comma y plus uh, delta y minus u x y that is my second bracketed expression yes this one you can see here my second bracketed expression that will be equal to okay fine can you tell me what will be this as per Lagrange's mean value theorem remember here the change is happening in y values so what I will write absolutely correct this will be now the partial derivative of u with respect to y so u y x is remaining fixed x comma now what is that remember i have uh, i have another number delta y1 such that delta y1 mod of delta y1 is less than mod of delta y so this is y plus delta y1 in a similar way this will be my f prime c into b minus a so in this case pretty simple b minus a will be delta y so, this I am getting this. Now, I am marking this important equations as my equation number. Say earlier, I think I got two equations, one and two. So, now let us mark it as equation number, say three. I am marking this as equation number three. This is my equation number three. So, now uh, let us assume a function phi. Let as assume a function phi uh, of this delta x and delta y. I am assuming a function phi of delta x and delta y as u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x y this minus ux the partial derivative of u with respect to x actually this symbol stands for or this symbol stands for partial derivative of u with respect to the suffix whatever is in the suffix 
So this stands for the partial derivative of u with respect to x. This stands for partial derivative of u with respect to y. I hope you are familiar with these symbols, which I uh, I use a lot. So u x x y uh, delta x delta x plus u y x y delta y. So let us consider this function as my phi. I am considering a function phi delta x delta y as this. Uh, let us call this as my equation number uh, 4. Let us call this as my equation number 4. Okay. If we do again a bit manipulation, we will be getting phi of delta x delta y can be written as equal to say u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x comma y plus delta y you will be you will be understanding why i am doing this just wait for one or two more minutes minus u x y minus u x y so actually I have subtracted this term. So I have to add it. Okay, let us add it plus u x comma y plus delta y and the other terms. Other term means the remaining two terms in the second bracket of equation number four. So that means minus u x x y delta x minus u y x y delta y so this okay okay uh, now okay now let us swap let us swap the position of these two elements let us swap the position of these two elements so if i swap the position of these two elements if I swap the position of these two elements, what I will get? So I'm just swapping the position of these two. I have swapped the position of these two. The purpose is, if you now look at the case, then this is your, uh, this is the left-hand side of the first equation of the set of equations three. And if you look at this second, uh, this particular expression, this is the left-hand side of the uh, second equation of your set of equations 3 if you look in this way therefore therefore if I use equation 3 therefore if I use equation 3 what do you get therefore from 3 therefore I can write from 3 from 3 what I get I get that this is equal to uh, okay let me have equal set of equations 3 in front of us so that we can replace accordingly Okay, uh, from 3, this can be written as equal to, uh, say, ux x plus delta x1 comma y plus delta y into delta x minus ux x y delta x. plus let me have some space so that i can write the second one plus so uh, you can see that this is the uh, the yellow bracketed portion that means this portion is your this expression so i can simply replace this by u y x comma y plus delta y1 into delta y minus this remaining term u y x y delta y so this is my uh, simplification for uh, phi delta x delta y okay therefore i can write phi 
delta x delta y divided by say delta x plus i delta y is equal to uh, from the first expression if i take delta x common then that will become and plus the second expression let me have some space plus uh, again i can take delta y common from the second expression so this will be so this will be my uh, expression for phi delta x delta y by delta x plus delta y you will immediately understand why i have done this you will immediately understand uh, now i can write means if i compare the numerator and denominator of this expression i have since uh, this mod of delta x, I can say straight away this will be lesser than mod of delta x plus i delta y. Uh, similarly, mod of uh, delta y, mod of delta y will be lesser than or equal to mod of delta x plus i delta y. That means this expression is again you can consider uh, that uh, uh, the mod of this expression will be less or equal to one so this will be less or equal to one and mod of the this expression also will be less or equal to one fine so this and uh, and and if i consider this particular expressions again i can further i further know that mod of delta x1 less than uh, mod of delta x and mod of delta y1 is less than mod of delta y. So I have these four uh, things, inequalities, which we know, and the fact, and, and we further know as per assumption, what was our assumption when we started doing this derivation? Our assumption was u and v are having continuous partial derivatives that has been our assumption u and v have continuous partial derivatives that means all these partial derivatives that are occurring here that is my ux and ui and ux and uy are continuous are continuous am i right or not can you recollect the definition of continuous function? So the definition of continuous function says that the definition of continuous function says that the limiting value will be equal to the functional value. That means, can I write, therefore can I write, since ux and u are continuous, can I write as an implication of that, that limit delta x plus i delta y approaches to 0. That means, in other words, we can write delta x comma delta y approaches to 0 comma 0 because this 0 means 0 plus i into 0. So, uh, 0 comma 0. Okay, fine. You can write that this this limit when when limit delta x plus i delta y approaches to 0 when um, say ux, if I apply this on ux, x plus delta x comma y plus delta y if ux is continuous can i say this will be equal to ux xy can i say that if ux is continuous this limit will be equal to uh, ux xy because uh, because actually this can you can consider as ux x plus 0 y plus 0 that means your delta x approaches to 0 delta y approaches to 0 so, the limiting value is equal to the functional value. Can I write in this way? So, if I write in this way, if I am allowed to write this, and, and actually we can write this because of this continuity. We, if, 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 if we write this, if we apply this logic to this function, therefore we get, therefore we get limit, limit, applying this logics to this expression, uh, this expression, we get limit delta x plus i delta y tend to 0 will be 0 on phi of delta x delta y by delta x plus 
i delta y will be equal to 0. So if we apply this understanding written in yellow color, since we have these things with us, then these things imply that limit delta x plus i delta y approaches to 0 on this function phi delta x delta y by delta x plus delta i delta y will be equal to 0. Let us call it, let us call this observation, let us call this equation as equation number 5. And remember that uh, this is equal to 0 only because my ux and uy are continuous. And as a result, you are getting uh, this, this, uh, this term when we apply the limit on this particular expression, you will get ux xy. Uh, why? Because moreover, because this mod of x1 is again uh, lesser than, uh, 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 so, sorry, this mod of delta x1 is lesser than mod of delta x. So this particular equality will, will yield a zero value here. And since this particular expression is less than one, so this limiting value will uh, can never be infinity. So uh, uh, 0 into a finite number. So you will get 0 in both the places. So as a result, your limit will also be 0. So if you apply in this way, you will get this. Therefore, what you can write? If we, if we go back to the definition of this phi, yes, equation 4. Therefore, from equation 4, what we can write? Equation 4, from equation 4, we can write that this expression is equal to from 4 I get, therefore I can say from 4, therefore I can say from 4, what I get? From 4 I get that u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y minus u x y will be equal to u x x y delta x plus u y x y delta y plus phi delta x comma delta y uh, where so this uh, let us call this as equation number six hold your patience a bit more maybe for two more minutes the purpose is we need to show that fz is analytic that is our purpose of doing all these things. So this. Similarly, similarly, if we do a similar, uh, if we define, like here, if you see in 4, we define a function phi with, uh, 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 for, this, for this u, for this u. See, everywhere there is u. In a similar way, if I define a function, say, psi for v, then in a similar way, I can prove that then in a similar way, I can prove that I'm simply writing, I'm not doing, I'm pretty sure you all can do this uh, part of the calculation. I'm not doing that. That's why you just try to do. Uh, similarly, you can, you, can, you can show that V of X plus delta X comma Y plus delta Y minus V of X Y will be equal to V X X Y delta X plus vy xy delta y plus uh, if I define a function psi in a uh, in a similar way as I defined uh, a phi so I will get some function psi of delta x delta y am I right or not if I do it if I do it for uh, for in a similar way that I have done for you so I get this where I will get a similar expression that where limit delta x plus i delta y approaches to 0 uh, psi of delta x delta y divided by delta x plus i delta y will be equal to 0, will be equal to 0. Let us call this as equation number, let us call the first one as equation number 7 and this one as equation number 8. So now, uh, if we do, say, if I do 6 plus i into 7, i means root over of minus 1, the imaginary unit. So if I do, let me have that. If I do uh, 6 plus, if I do 6 plus 
i into 7. Can you tell me what I'll be getting? This i is square root of minus 1. 6 plus i into 7. Can you tell me what I'll be getting? I'll be getting u x plus delta x comma y plus delta y uh, plus i v x plus delta x comma y plus delta y. This is the first term. If I consider these two terms, now let us write the second terms. So this minus uh, u x y from the first one and i multiplied with 7. So that means plus i into v x y. Is anything clicking in your mind? Is anything clicking in your mind? Is equals to so similarly I will write the other terms. So I will write this will be equal to this will be equal to uh, uh, say mm, mm, if we we'll do quickly this will be equal to u x y delta x plus i v x u x x y delta x plus i into v x x y delta x. So if I take delta x common then this can be written as if I take delta x common this can be written as u x x y plus i into v x x y uh, plus i into v x x y uh, I have taken delta x common so delta x plus what will be the second term v y x y delta y and there the second term will be you can see u y x y delta y so uh, I will get u suffix y x y let us take delta y common plus i into v y x y delta y plus the other two terms that means plus phi of delta x delta y plus i into psi of delta x delta y so simply uh, if you consider 6 plus i into 7 i get this now our hypothesis was that u and v satisfy cr equations therefore we can write ux is equals to vy and uy is equals to minus vx so that means uh, this expression can be written as minus vx xy and this expression can be written as ux xy so now if we consider and uh, if we consider this thing if we consider this thing then this further can be simplified as ux xy so uh, so this uh, ux xy plus i vx v suffix x xy uh, delta x uh, plus if i take i common if i take i common then this can be written as ux that means if i take i common and write this one this term first with this ux then ux xy now uh, this will be minus vx xy so that means i can write this as plus i into vx xy because i into i i square minus one you will get this uh, multiplied with delta y so that means uh, a nice expression we got plus plus uh, phi delta x delta y plus i into psi delta x delta y i need only one more step therefore what uh, therefore this now can you tell me so so from these two so from this two this one and this one i can take uh, this part of the expression common I can see in both the place I have this. Now, can you tell me if I apply, if I if I let, if I let 
uh, if I let uh, delta x plus i delta y tend to 0, then can you tell me if I let delta x plus i delta y tend to 0, then what we will get? Okay, let us see that. Actually, if you carefully uh, uh, remember, if you carefully remember my f of uh, x plus i y, f of x plus i y, f of x plus i y was uh, equal to means f z and that is u x y plus i v x y. This expression is nothing but f of x plus delta x plus i into y plus delta y. Am I right or not? And this term is uh, 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 f of x plus i y. Uh, you can think in that way. So this actually expression becomes, if we think from this perspective, we can write, we can write this as in a more simplified way, we can write this as f of x plus delta x. Okay, let me have one more bracket plus i into y plus delta y. Now, if I take this, uh, if I take this thing common, so I will get a term like delta x plus i delta y. So that if I divide in both the sides, I will get delta x plus i delta y will be equal to nothing but ux xy plus i into vx xy plus this entire expression uh, phi uh, delta x uh, delta y plus i psi delta x delta y divided by uh, delta x plus i delta y because this will not get cancelled for this term. Therefore, can you tell me letting delta x plus i delta y tends to 0. That is, now if you can remember your delta x plus i delta y is h. Just let us quickly see from where we started. Your delta x plus i delta y is h and your x plus i y is z. So, uh, uh, z plus h will be x plus delta x plus i into y plus delta y. So, if we apply this entire understanding here, so what do we get? We get, if we let limit this delta 10 to 0, we get what? We get limit h tends to 0. Say I will write in this side, I will write everything in terms of, sorry, I missed one term. I missed one term. Sorry, extremely sorry. I missed one term here. Minus f of x plus i y. I missed this term here. I missed the second term here. Extremely sorry. I missed this uh, second term here. That means this term. This can be written as f of x plus i y minus f of x plus i y. Fine. So that means this can be written as limit h tends to 0. So if I write, if I write in the left hand side everything in terms of z and h, then I get limit h tends to 0 f of z plus h minus f of z divided by h is equal to is equal to is equal to what this is equal to now uh, uh, this will remain as it is this ux plus iv xy this will remain as it is ux xy plus i vx xy this will remain as it is plus now can you tell me as delta x plus i delta y tend to zero what i can say about the value of this now look at your expression eight and your expression six so as delta x plus i delta y tend to zero both your phi and psi approaches to zero so that means i get this limit h tends to 0 f of z plus h minus fz uh, by h 
is equal to ux plus i dx xy. That means, what do we get? That means, what do we get? We get that f is differentiable because this partial derivatives, both ux and uy are continuous as per your assumption. That means they exist. So, this, since these values exist and these values are equal to this limit, therefore, and this limit is nothing but, this limit is nothing but your f prime z when this exists and this exists. So, I can write f prime z is equal to ux xy plus i into vx xy. So, a great result we have got after such lengthy derivation. Now, since ux and vx are continuous, f prime is also continuous. So, f prime exists and f prime is continuous. That means f is, that means f is continuously differentiable. That means f is analytic. Therefore, f is analytic. Therefore, f is analytic. So, we got that whenever as per our supposition, as per our initial supposition, whenever u and v have continuous partial derivatives and whenever u and v satisfy Cauchy-Riemann equations, then we, uh, we can say that f is analytic. And you remember that we have applied the assumption of continuity for evaluating this limits, limit which is present in 5 and uh, uh, 8. And we have applied Cauchy-Riemann equations uh, in this place of the simplification, in this place of the simplification. Unless you have the two, you cannot get this result. So that's why we say that whenever my functions are satisfy, my u and v satisfies Cauchy-Riemann equations and they are continuous, then we can say that the function is analytic. Therefore, listen carefully, we can sum up or summarize our entire process as let u and v be let u and v be real valued functions defined on a region g and suppose that u and v have continuous partial derivatives then f defined as fz equals to uxy plus ivxy is analytic if and only if u and v satisfy the Cauchy-Riemann equations. So, we can write the necessary and sufficient condition as we can write the necessary and sufficient condition as. So, if a function is given to us and if we need to check whether it is analytic or not, we will simply see, we will simply check whether the function satisfies Cauchy-Riemann equations or not and whether the four first order partial derivatives are continuous or not. So, Cauchy-Riemann equations plus continuity of the partial derivatives implies uh, 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 the analytic character of a function f. So, this is the necessary and sufficient condition. Remember, not only CR equations imply analytic an analytic character. CR equations along with continuity of the partial derivatives will imply that the function is analytic. So, in our next video, we will solve some problems on analytic functions. Take care.